I'm Heath Copes, and I've been asked to take part in the Oral History of Criminology Project. The aim of the project is to preserve an account of the development of the field's ideas through recording retrospectives provided by its decorated scholars for future generations. Today we'll be speaking with Neil Schober, who's probably best known for his ethnographic research and his theoretical insights into crime as choice. As a way of background, Dr. Schober began his career in criminal justice as a prison sociologist at Illinois State Prison in Joliet. He earned his PhD in sociology in 1971 from the University of Illinois. That same year, he took a position at the Department of Sociology at the University of Tennessee, where he remained until retiring in 2010. He is currently Professor Emeritus, but I should note he's told me that he's retired from the University of Tennessee, but not from the job. During this nearly 40-year career, he's been a visiting fellow in Oxford, Australia, and Sweden. He's won the Gil Guy's Lifetime Achievement Award from the White Color Crime Research Consortium, and he's an American Society of Criminology Fellow. He's published seven books. Uh, three of my favorite would be Aging Criminals, Great Pretenders, and Choosing White Color Crime, which he co-authored with Andy Hoekstedt. He's published over 60 articles and book chapters that focus on such topics as social organization and burglary, gender roles in crime, regulatory enforcement, criminal decision making, and more recently, white collar crime. Now, since part of the, the goal of the Oral History Project is to give insights into the people, I'll let people know that those who've worked with Neil Schober refer to him as the chief. It's a very fitting nickname <laughs> from my perspective, but how did you come up with this nickname? Well, my first doctoral student was Bill Bankston, was from Louisiana, and uh, somehow in the probably the first six months that I knew Bill and we had daily interaction, the character, the chief, who appeared in radio Superman episodes. Superman, Lois Lane and Clark Kent were reporters for the Daily Planet, and their boss, the editor, they referred to as the chief. The chief was kind of a gruff, you know, sort of fellow, but big heart and all of that. So it started out as a joke, as the chief. And it's stuck largely because of Bill. Um, so how, how does a, a working class kid from Ohio get into academics? You're going to speak up and yeah, more clearly. <laughs> how did a working class kid from Ohio get into academics? Luck. <laughs> uh, I, I can expand on that. Okay. Uh, Please. I, in fact, I was just talking before we started this interview with an editor, and, and uh, if I had not grown up in a city where the state university was located, in a state which required that public school graduates be admitted to the state university if they wanted to apply, I would not be here today because I was a mediocre student at best for the first 14 years of my life. I went to an inner city high school and managed to graduate in the lowest third of my class. Uh, and I started undergraduate school at Ohio State in engineering. <laughs> and the state permitted you, the university permitted you to stay in school as long as you achieved a 0 0.75 grade point average. My first quarter I got a 0 0.85, which kept me in. And uh, mostly it was luck. I happened to live in proximity to a state university. They had to admit me, though I was an awful student at the time. And eventually I uh, extracted my head from my exterior, posterior, and uh, here I am. So what changed? What, what converted you from this poor student? Well, I suspect as important as anything, probably most important, was meeting my wife. I uh, was very unfocused and, and undisciplined about a lot of things before, so it gave me some purpose. Once I met my wife, I started back to school, and even when I worked in the joint, I went to school at night. So, so you were a prison sociologist? Correct. What is a prison sociologist? Prison sociologists can be looked at two ways. One way is the job description. Our job consisted of 
interviewing newly admitted inmates to the penitentiary and writing classification report on them. Classification in those days is different from what classification is today. Today it's security. In those days, classification was based on one's, it's hard to say these words without vomiting, without puking, uh, but uh, classification in those days meant that you interviewed and did an analysis of someone and then wrote a report where you classified their personality type or what they needed if they were going to be changed for the good while they were incarcerated. So I spent 30% of my time gathering information for and writing classification reports, 30% of my time doing parole progress reports when people were to, were to appear before the parole board, and 30% of the time responding to inmate problems which they wouldn't have had if they hadn't been incarcerated. So I, and the other way of viewing that work was it was, and I told classes this for four decades, we were the face that was held up to the public as a way of legitimizing incarceration and what was done to people in those days. So we were the soft, humane face of incarceration. They, we don't even go through the pretense of trying to be soft and humane appearing today. So, so you think working as a prison sociologist uh, shaped how you <coughs> see offenders, interact with offenders, or your outlook on, on crime? Well, it certainly changed the way I think about criminal justice organizations and dynamics, no question about it, because the reality of the work I did and the public representation of it were vastly different. I suppose the most important way that working in the joint influenced where I'm at today is I learned to talk to people who violated the law and interacted with them daily. So you learn to talk the way they talk and, and be comfortable around them. So I, I didn't have any aversion to offenders by the time I had quit working there. Now anyone who's read your <clears throat> work knows that social class is important. How do you think your background helped or constrained your, uh, your outlook? Well, I could talk for a long time about that, but mercifully I will not. Uh, Social class is every bit as important, every bit as important as race and gender, and yet it's generally ignored because there are almost no academics whose origins are in the working class, almost none. But I think it was beneficial in one respect that I never expected much from life, and you're counseled when you grow up in that stratum of society that you're told that life isn't fair, get over it, there ain't no justice in the world. These are all things that you just learn growing up there. And if you come to accept those or see the world that way, then it means you're not going to be disappointed as quickly or as easily as people who've come to think the world life will be differently. The other way, I think that uh, working there, uh, or I'm sorry, that social class has affected me, is it means that I think in order to be a good ethnographer, it helps, it's not indispensable, it helps if you've known other worlds, if you've lived in other worlds so that you have a, you know that life can be different, institutions can be different, people are always the same, but, but the institutions are different. So it gives you a vantage point from, for, for examining wherever you're at today, and I've told you whether or not you agree with me, I don't know. There are really two of me, you know, in any situation. There's the me that has learned to be as bourgeois as I'm ever going to be. And then there's the blue collar kid from a family of 10 kids who, you know, uh, didn't expect much and has been very lucky. Let's talk about some of the, the people that you worked with uh, in graduate school. Who had an impact on, on your career in your, in your early stages? I suspect my graduate school experience is different than most students. I have no way of knowing, but I was married when I started and I had, we had one child. And I worked very hard. And I spent most of my time either in the library, in class, or at home. And I, did, I didn't have much contact with other students, to be honest about it. And I'm unusual in the sense that I had no close relationship with any faculty member. In fact, I scarcely had any relationship. I went to class, I did what was required, I read constantly, 
stayed in the library and I was with my family. And I really didn't have any close, I had one close friend, fellow student in graduate school who was a, a Polish kid from Chicago. And all the others were just faces in the crowd. Well, were there any uh, people that you read that inspired your work? You mean faculty at Fac Illinois? Yeah, or just yeah, academics. Well, at the time, Norm Denzen was a new faculty member. I think he came to Illinois at the same time I started graduate school. He was four years younger than I. He, I think he was got his doctorate and he was 26. And Norm was, I haven't seen Norm in many years, but you, you, you couldn't ignore Norm. Norm was a big person in a lot of ways. And he championed the qualitative research, and and uh, uh, and so I think Norm Norm Denzel helped me to see what qualitative research is, and a little bit about doing it. Uh, but I, had to, you know, mo I think the most influential effects on me in graduate school were from reading. They weren't from faculty members. I mean, I read Karl Marx like there was no tomorrow, and became very knowledgeable about Marx's work. And I did it on purpose because I, I didn't know anything about it. And I also think that it's very important for students to learn to think and analyze at different levels of abstraction. And that's as high as you can go, the ma macro sociology. And then the interactional face-to-face -face stuff is as low as you can go. And it's the ability, or trying to connect those so that you understand how interaction is, effect is constrained by institutional and historical dynamics that I think is critical, has been critical for me. Uh, and I've told students, you need to learn to think about across different levels of analysis. And reading Marx did that as much as anything for me. So if we look back over your whole body of work, what themes do you think are most important? Well, I'll give you an honest answer first. I don't know. Uh, but. Right well, what, now, what, I'm sorry. Which works do you look back on and with, with the most pride? I like Great Pretenders a lot because there's a lot of me in that book, and it's the first book I wrote, not the not the only one, but it's the first book I wrote that I was absolutely confident about everything I said in that book, and it's a wonderful feeling to be able to write something when you are confident that you're correct, and whoever might criticize <coughs> you, you can show them that they're incorrect. So. That's a good thing. That is one of my favorite books. The problem with the book is every time I come up with a new idea, I go back to Great Pretenders and it's in there already. So you, you. Well, I think it's characteristic of academics or, or, uh, who, uh, who who write write anything that a year or two or ten years hence somebody will write something and not cite that work, a work of theirs, and I say I said that, you know, in that work. I've had this experience 15 times since I wrote Great Pretenders. But when people are, are not the author of a work and they're just reading it for what they can learn, they don't see those four sentences that you buried in a paragraph somewhere that you could have written an article about, but you didn't because you're writing a book. And so, I've had this experience a number of times. So why the title Great Pretenders? I. Uh, I grew up in the era when rock and roll was new, and the Platters were a major R&B group at that time. And I was crazy about the Platters and Hank Williams. First two LPs I ever bought were the Platters, Encore, Golden Hits, and Hank Williams, 14 Greatest Hits. So, and, the, and, and the Platters recorded a song called The Great Pretender. And I don't know why I decided that someday I was going to use that in something I wrote. But I suspect I wrote the introduction to that book in order to make sense of calling the book The Great Pretenders. I know in the introduction I say almost precisely these words, the label pretenders is apt, is apt because most know in reflective moments that a day of reckoning almost certainly will come. So they're pretending that it's not going to happen when, when they're not high and when they're talking to their mama, they know that it's going to end. Mm -hmm. Now, since we're talking about great pretenders, uh, what criticisms have been leveled against the book? I have no idea. <laughs> well, I have no idea. <laughs> they just don't tell you. Huh? Could I go farther and say I don't care? <laughs>
<laughs> well, a lot of people read it, interpret it as, as a, a rational choice book. Do you see it as a rational choice no, book? No, not at all. I mean, that's a piece of it. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what I was trying to accomplish, if anything, in the book. Uh, well, I must have been trying to accomplish something besides just write a bunch of pages, but it, it, it's lost in my memory. Well, you know, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I'll go back. We were talking about John Hagen before this conversation started. I wrote that book because John Hagen was the editor of a series with Westview Press at the time. I'm sorry, series. <laughs> I forgot where you're from. <laughs> John Hagen was editor of a series for Westview Press, and he had given the editor of the press a list of names of people who he thought might be interested in writing a book. And I assume he also had some confidence in these people or he wouldn't have given. So I was one of the people whose names uh, the editor was given. He called me before the meetings in Cincinnati back in 25 BC or whenever it was. And we met and he told me that John, and, and it's because John Hagen expressed confidence in me and and was interested in perhaps seeing me do a book that I did. Now you have another book that was well received in, in some fields, um, I think I've heard you say not as well received in criminology, it was the uh, regulatory enforcement book on coal mining. Yeah. Why do you think that didn't get as much attention in the discipline? Uh, I can only speculate. Um, at that time, topic of regulation was only um, just becoming big. You know, Reagan had been elected at almost exactly that time, was trying to decimate the federal gut regulatory structure as I saw it. But, but none of this had caught fire in academia. Uh, I did the book as much as anything because I was offended by strip mining. You know, if you live in East Tennessee and travel 30 miles outside of the city, you see the ravages. And so I really became interested in originally because of coal mining, and the strip mining. Uh, I think in some ways it's one of the best books we ever did because we collected so much data. And I think, I know I'm sounding immodest, I think we used it very effectively in the book. I was living here on leave from the university when, uh, when we gathered the data. So. I spent part of my day running around interviewing older ex-offenders and the other part of my day either on Capitol Hill or talking to lobbyists or whatever, or stealing, st I better not say that, <laughs> or examining records in the Office of Service Mining. When you won the award for ASC Fellow, I was able to see one of the letters. And one of the letters said, one of the things they were most impressed is that you seem to get there first on a lot of topics. So you're doing things on gender roles and crime, kind of before gender really took off. Uh, you did things on social organization of burglary before that topic got popular. Um, you put your book, Aging Criminals, you've seen the get before uh, life course criminology. How do these ideas come to you? How are you able to kind of be a step ahead? Well, you've asked two questions. Where do ideas come from and then why are they timely? Right. Uh, I don't know why they're timely. Uh, it just it's happenstance, you know, that it works out that way. I mean, if 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 you were to mention gender rules and delinquency as an example, I had a young colleague then who I really liked, you know, and I was trying to get him to submit a proposal to NIMH uh, to study gender rules, but he, for one reason or another, he couldn't quite get it done, and so. I, listen, this is how you do it. Do this, do this, do this. And so I ended up as a co-PI on this study, but I've never been particularly interested in gender roles and delinquency. I thought it was pretty good research for the time. But, you know. and, and then, you know, like if, you were, if we were to go another example of aging criminals, as I say at the beginning of that book, I have fond, distinct memories when I worked in the joint of filing cabinets that were filled with the jackets of men who had been paroled and absconded and had never been heard from again. And sometimes I would pull out those jackets and look through them. You know, a person would have a rap sheet three pages long and then, you know, they were paroled, absconded, and they're gone. So what happened to these people? And of course, if you work in the joint, probably if you work anywhere in criminal justice, you become familiar with the notion that people burn out, they age out, you know. 
but to say that people burn out of crime isn't really much of an explanation. So it just interested me. You know, what, what happens to people after they've gone through this process for the first 30 or 35 years of their life? So while you've used uh, several methodologies, you seem to gravitate towards qualitative research. Why do you think you gravitate towards that method? Well, probably gravitates a good word because I do not regard myself exclusively as an ethnographer. I've used just about every kind of method that can be used and I would almost bet that there are few people who are social scientists who have used a range of methods that I have used in various studies. I've used everything, you know, even observation. You know. uh, but I think I'm not uncomfortable with being labeled a qualitative researcher because I, I'm always interviewing. Again, it's because there are two of me. And the me that started life in Columbus, Ohio is always here. And so I'm always interviewing people. They do not know that. You know, they think I'm just interacting, but really I'm interviewing them. And I've done it to hundreds of people. Uh, so I, I just like talking to people. At, at a, it's what we would call, you would understand this, but maybe others wouldn't. It's old boyism, you know. I can old boy with anybody, absolutely. You know. I can go from being a person who is dispassionate and intellectual, from just like that, to talking to somebody like, you know, we grew up together in the same crappy conditions and talk the same way. It's just as natural as anything. Well, speaking of the, your varied methods, one thing that you do a lot is, um, I don't know, a lot might be an exaggeration. One thing you do is you use autobiographies in your work. How do you think these autobiographies can be used more in the discipline, and, and why do you use them so much? I just, I just uh, read half of Jack Abramoff's book, Capital Punishment, flying up here. You know, it's the latest one. Um, <coughs> I originally started reading autobiographies of criminals because it was a way of killing time when I was an undergraduate. You had time between classes, so rather than do what I should have done, which was read the coursework, I would go to the library and started reading autobiographies of offenders. I remember them. And I, I, I guesstimated that I'd read a couple hundred. And I, I mean, I think they're just like interviews except you don't get to ask people the questions. So they write the book and perhaps they never mention something that you would have asked them about if you had been sitting with them. But the very fact that they weren't asked questions in my mind lends a certain credibility to it because they're not responding to questions. They're telling you, as I reconstruct my life, these are the things that appear to me to have been important. And I think it's like a gift at reading an autobiography. You, know, it's, you read it, and, and, and at some point, you know, you find a place. I interviewed somebody. I interviewed 20 people who said something very similar. So it reinforces your belief that yes, you've observed a regularity or a pattern. Plus, you know, a lot of them are interesting reading. Some, some of those people, were, as you know, some of those people were very good writers. Not many, but some. Have, have you received much criticism for using qualitative methods? I don't know and I don't care. <laughs> we'll move on. I mean, I, you know, I, uh, okay. I'll try to give you a more civil, expansive answer, okay? I mean, when I went to graduate school, Illinois, and I think this is true of maybe every department, was rent with this conflict between quantitative and qualitative methods. And God, how many speeches or talks we must have listened to by experts on one side or the other. And I grew weary of it, even in graduate school. But you've got to learn it then because someone may ask you a question about it on a prelim or something. But it's always this contention or conflict I've been aware of. It interests me zero. Now there are, you know, all you're trying to do if you're a, 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 a social scientist is you're trying to arrive at some kind of an understanding of how something works, you know. And there are, there are, if there aren't a hundred ways of getting there, but there are 25 ways of getting there. And none are any better than the others. Quantitative methods aren't a damn bit better than any other kind of method, despite the fact that there are hundreds of people who believe this is the way to truth, if not salvation. 
you know, bullshit. You know, or, I mean, this any any way of gathering information about the world that helps you arrive at a confident and valid, credible interpretation of something is fine with me. You know. But writing on bathroom walls, you know, reading it, if that helps you, go for it. I mean, I find the comments that people post online about news stories, uh, which I don't read a lot of them, because there's a monotonous repetition to mm -hmm. them. But I certainly became convinced, in part, that we entered this new era of thinking about crime, called Crime as Choice, 40 years ago, in part from reading comments of people online. I read some this very morning. People, it's a choice they make. He decided, you know, so it's only fair that we punish him, you know. I mean, it's, a, it's such a different way of thinking about crime from the way that prevailed when I was an undergraduate student. I went to work in the penitentiary to help people. I know it sounds foolish, and it was, but, but that's the way we thought about crime. I didn't go to work at the penitentiary to make people's days miserable. I did, but for some, but they, they deserved it. <laughs> So now you're, you're, you seem to be working in white collar crime. What do you think is the, the, the state of white collar crime right now, of the discipline? Well, whatever it is, it's probably never going to change. Uh, I don't know how I would characterize it. it it's, you know, it's the preoccupation of a rump group of people who can't get over the inequality in the world, the, the material inequality. And I don't mean that in a critical way, because clearly I'm one of them. Uh, but it's not a large group of people. And it's never going to be anything different than it is, I fear, because it's the only place that criminology directly confronts the misconduct of people who count. It's the only place. You know? uh, and for that reason, if it gets if it were to, to be transformed into something else, it would scare people who count. And people who count have a way of getting their way. I don't count. <laughs> <laughs> you don't either, I don't <laughs> Nor do you. <laughs> I'm sorry if you're reading it for the first time. That's all right. <laughs> so now, you know, you've been in the discipline 40 years. How do you think the discipline's changed from when you got in to, to where it is now? Well, I don't think it's changed at all, and, and I don't look for any change. Yes, it's changed. The, the, the questions that we explore and the questions that we have panels on at the national meetings have changed, and they will change again. Uh, but I've been coming to meetings for 40 years, and, and I think it's reasonable to look back on 40 years of doing criminology and say, what has happened? We're still doing the same thing, right? Except now we're concerned about list of three things that are big today that were not big, had not been invented before when I was a younger person. Uh, but I'm also, a, I'm very interested in the sociology of knowledge. Uh, I think having, living in two worlds makes it easier for you to appreciate the significance of the sociology of knowledge and reading Marx and I mean I read a lot of classical people when I was in grad school for no reason other than I recognized I didn't know anything about this and I wanted to know about it. The sociology of knowledge has, if, if you understand the sociology of knowledge and you understand that the discipline of criminology is really much part of a much larger enterprise and it's constrained and shaped by that larger context. Plus you have these internal dynamics of people who are professionals and academics all trying to make careers and trying to get ahead. And when you add together the historical context with the fact that you've got all these young people who are trying to make names for themselves, criminology hasn't changed except in the ways of things we talk about and I doubt it's going to ever be much different. I don't know if you've heard this from anyone else. but. I mean, I've come into meetings for 40 years, and I, I, yeah, I would be pleased if we'd solved something that I could point to and say, yeah, we definitely fixed that. That was a problem in 1965. It ain't a problem no more. You know? 
Excuse the double negative. I do that sometimes. So, do you have any advice for young scholars? No, I don't have. I generally don't give advice to people, uh, but I'm not sure I would start down the same path today that I did in 1964, whenever it was, because universities have changed so much. I mean, they've become corporations. And, uh, it's it's a different kind of work experience today. Mind you, I never had any difficulty, and I loved the way the job that I had. I've told a thousand people in my life I can't imagine a way of earning a living that I would like any more than this because I know what work is. You know? I mean, I used to work with my hands, and this is a lot better. I, I think one quote you said that I still think of is, um, why would I retire from this? Yeah. Ron Akers has said to me several times, and to others, when he's asked, when are you going to retire? He said, I've got the job that people retire for. You know? And there's a lot of truth in that. You know? I mean, it's, I was a misfit in the penitentiary. You know, I, I did things that no one else did. And it's because I've got this cussedness in me, or contrariness in me. You know, but I was really out of place in a university. You know? I mean, I was an outlier in a lot of ways. You know? And the universities permitted you, you could do that. You know, you could you could be a, a very individualistic and be very happy and at home in the university and I was. I mean you didn't know me when I was really young and dressed, you know, I used to wear a cat, ten gallon hat, you know. <laughs> I did not. <laughs> I do know you would always have a, a at least a jacket in your office just in case you had, yeah, to, you had to go meet the double nets. <laughs> <laughs> when I lived here, I still have the tie. I, it was kind of a schizophrenic life. You know, my family was back in Tennessee, and so I was living by myself over in the Maryland side. And I was going to Capitol Hill one morning to interview a staff member. My God, we'd struggled to get this bastard to give us an interview. And of course, I'd forgotten to take a tie. You know, I thought I'd better wear a tie. So I didn't wear jeans. So I got off the metro at the stop at Woody, Woodruff and, and Lathrop. So I don't know if the same stop is still there or if Woody's is still in business. I jumped off the metro, ran into the store, bought a tie, got back on, on the train. And it's one of three ties I still have. <laughs> yeah, buddy. <laughs> Was there anything that you would like to conclude with? Is this the cue you wrote? <laughs> I don't recognize it as such. I think you do recognize it as such. Do you recognize it as such? I threw that out. Well, my wife and I, we've been married 48 years now. And I often say to her, I just can't believe how lucky we've been. Now, Baptists say you're blessed, right? But I don't believe in the deity, so. You know, we've just been lucky. Uh, I've had almost no bad luck in my life since leaving home, my parents' home. Uh, I've just been lucky. And, and I was born in, in 1940, so that when I was an age where I became interested in graduate school and got a degree, the American universities were, 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 were engorged with all these baby boom generation young people. Right. And universities were expanding like crazy between ni roughly 1966 and 1975 or something like that. So I, I was lucky. I was born in 1940, born before the war. Uh, I was lucky in the sense that I learned that you've got to work in this world. It ain't fair, but life ain't fair. And in other ways, uh, meeting my wife certainly was a fortunate occurrence. Meeting me was a fortune. <laughs> well, that goes without saying. I mean, perhaps I should say that. Well, you know, I was talking with Brendan. I don't, I don't know if or even care if you're supposed to be in this, but I was talking with Brendan <laughs> I'm now before the interview, <laughs> and uh, broke the fourth wall. What? You broke the fourth wall. <laughs> Anyhow, you said that there was supposed to be in, in its inception or conception 
a, an emphasis on mentor-mentee relationships. I've had almost no mentees, almost none. You know. And certainly had none except just a handful in the first 20 years. When I got out of grad school, I had no reason at all to believe that I could ever be a success academic. None, zero, none. So I was launching into a new territory, and I didn't know if I could be successful, and I thought having a graduate student just became a millstone around your neck because you're partly responsible for this person being successful. And I didn't know if I could swim. So, and so I, it, it didn't terrify me, but I was just scared of getting too close to graduate students because they may fail because of your failure. And it, it, was, it took 20 years before I became even comfortable dealing with graduate students. Now, there were exceptions. I mean, you know Bill, Bill Banks. Bill and I got long famous. Well, you know, I've heard that it's common for people who come from working class backgrounds and academics to have a lot of self-doubt. Did you experience this? That's what I just told you. <laughs> I just told you when I got out of graduate school, I didn't know if I could do anything. I had no reason to think I could ever do anything. You know? And <clears throat> self-doubt, lack of confidence, is a major consequence of material deprivation. It's, it's one of the major consequences. If I were to list some of the major effects of living in a materially deprived world, during your formative years, or any time probably, but certainly in your formative years, low self-confidence would be a big part of it. No question about it. So for those new students who, who are coming up from these backgrounds that experience this, how did you overcome it finally? Well, luck, you know, but I, I've thought a lot about some of these things, and perhaps you and I have even talked about them, or I've talked about them with you, over the years. So I've thought about these things a great deal. Uh, I think another characteristic of growing up in materially deprived circumstances is the emphasis on work. It's very common. You read autobiographies of working class people, and I've read as many of those as I've read of offenders, you know, who also incidentally come from the, uh, under a disadvantaged backgrounds. But one of the things that comes through loud and clear in books that you read about people from the working class is the emphasis placed by their parents on you need to work, you need to work, you need to learn to work, you need not to gripe and complain about work. And it's very different from the bourgeois world, very, very different. So I acquired a strong work ethic, which may be hereditary, I don't know, but it certainly wasn't harmed or diminished in any sense by socialization. So I've always had a work ethic, strong work ethic. People remark on it all my life. People have remarked on it, even away from the university. You know, and just work I do with my hands. Uh, and I'm always, obviously I'm not stupid, you know. So, I mean, I must have a halfway decent hard drive, and I'm not afraid of work. And I didn't want to fail, you know. Fear of failure, probably. No, it's not fear of failure. It's not that you're afraid of failure. You don't think about it, but you know you can't go back. You know, you you've been given an opportunity, and and you can't go home and say I had a shot, and I screwed it up. I can't imagine. Them. Probably the best, besides meeting my wife, the best good fortune I had was I was uh, uh, awarded a, national, a federally funded fellowship. Uh, which allowed me to go to graduate school for the first three years. I had no work responsibilities. We got paid, I think, $300 a month. And, uh, and that was a real, real break. And I got that in part because, again, it was luck. I mean, I met a guy who brought his classes to the joint. And we went through a, a, a demonstration for the classes to demonstrate what we did in our work. So this guy brought his class to the joint, and I talked with him for about 10 minutes before or after the presentation. And I had just read Cloward and Olin's book, which you may never heard of, 
right? But it was a big book at the time, and I had, I had bought it and read it, and so I was engaging him in a conversation, and I think he was very impressed by that. I mean, he found this person working in the hellhole, you know, who'd read something. And I think when I applied to graduate school, he probably was on the committee that made decisions, and he remembered me, and that I wrote a very, I think a three-page single-space letter pleading with him, ignore, you know, the earlier years. When I went to night school, I did well. You got my head out of my butt by then. So what's next for the chief? Well, I continue, I plan to continue aggravating people. <laughs> Which is possible. <laughs> Whatever gives meaning to your life. <laughs> well, I don't know. Who knows what lies ahead, but right now I am working on that book project, which we decided not to include you in. <laughs> uh, and that's going to keep us busy for a couple of years. You know? uh, and I've never had more ideas that I wanted to write about and yet less time or interest in writing them than today. You know, I, I, have, I have ideas today that if I had the energy and the time or a student, I could make a bit of a splash with. You know. But at my age, other than being fat and jumping in the water, I ain't going to make no splashes. You know. um, it, and and uh, one changes you know, your perspectives. Everything changes with age. So I continue to work as hard as I want to work, you know, which is I go to the library to my cell uh, one to three mornings a week and, uh, and uh, work a few hours at other times of the day on intellectual stuff, not to keep you alive. Think that you're not dead yet. <laughs> well, how are we doing for time, Brent? Okay. I think we're about an hour in, I think. We've got an hour in? Yeah. We're about there. You done? You want to ask some more? I am done. Actually, since I've been invited in, I kind of want to ask you about uh, your writing style, your writing techniques. <laughs> you must. No, the, the microphone can hear me. But uh, I kind of want to ask you about uh, how you go about the writing process. You're, you have a renown or uh, you establish your reputation as being a very good writer. To what do you well, if that's that true, I'm very happy. It pleases me immensely if I'm thought of by anyone who understands how to write as a good writer. And I've worked very, very, very hard at writing. You know, I started to men mention of that earlier. Yeah. I work very hard at writing. I really appreciate the spoken, the written word. I think, I know this sounds far-fetched, but I think there's something genetic in my family, and certainly in me, that makes me word-oriented. Because I know the lyrics to thousands of songs, and I know I know I memorized hundreds of commercials from radio days when they used to have commercials like, "We're going to have shrimp booth shrimp tonight. <laughs> Nothing but booth will do. We're going to have shrimp tonight." Boo, 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 boo. I mean, this was this is a commercial on a Chicago radio station in 1963, and I've got hundreds of these things rattling around in my brain and thousands of song lyrics. I've got some sort of a word gene. And I just like good writing. Yeah. You know, you know I, Gil Geis, I, when I got out of graduate school and wrote, I didn't know if I'd ever write anything that anyone would care to publish or read. I mean, I'm being as serious as I could be here. But I wrote a paper in the first couple of months I was in graduate school to circulate among the faculty, and they liked it. And I was astounded, really was, you know. Uh, we got together at someone's house in the evening, and I was the first presenter who wrote the first paper, and we discussed it, and they liked it. And I sent that paper out of the blue to Gil Geis and to Howie, Howard Becker. And Gil, Ed, Gil was incapable of not editing everything he sees. And so he sent it back to me, and he marked it up, and I was so appreciative. And Howard Becker sent me a two-page single-space letter, which I still have. Very kind of the two. And when I looked at Gil's comments, I could see that, yes, well, even if I couldn't see that it made sense to change what he th wanted to change, I figured, he's a good writer, I'm not, I'm going to go with him. And, and so I've worked really hard at writing. I mean, uh, when I write a paper or a book, 
I go through so many iterations of the thing that you can hear trees falling, you know, for, for making the paper for this. It's, I mean, it's obscene how many iterations of something. I, I really like the word and my favorite stage of writing is when it's almost done and you're going through it for the last time. You can be cute, you can be clever, you can be, just change a few words, you know, and I love that part of writing. You know, I'm kind of a born smart ass, you know, if the, re you know, if the truth be told. And it's, it's the way this finds expression in writing, you know. I love to write, though I work very, very hard at it. I'm so envious of people who can just spew and fill a book, like John B. John Braithwaite. John can just do this, you know. Mind you, some of it shows that, but, you know. But, you know, he can do it. And I can't. I tried to learn once to write by dictating, but it just didn't go well. Or I didn't, because when I worked in the joint, I dictated reports. So I learned how to speak and put in the punctuation according to this uh, defendant, comma, on such and such a day, comma, you know, and, and, and to help the typist. But it's not as easy to do that with creative writing. When you're, going, when, you're, when you're dictating reports, and all those reports were the same, only the names changed. Once you learn to format, pick up that microphone. This inmate was admitted to the Illinois State Penitentiary on March 20, 1964. According to the official statement of facts, which is the state's attorney's report, you just read it into the record, you know, comma, or a paragraph. According to the inmate, then you have the inmate's account of the offense, which, you know, usually just diverges a bit. <laughs> and you have the official record, so you run through the offense, through the arrest record. And, you know, but you learn to do this by just talking. And, but it's not, it's not easy for me to do that creative writing by dictating. You know. And then I change so many things, even after I've got, you know. You, I don't know that you ever saw this in my writing. You probably saw it in your quote writing. <laughs> <laughs> I love to write, you know, and writing is just, I mean, it's, it's fun, it's creative, you know, and, but it was hard work. Yeah. I was worried there was not going to be an insult of me, but thank you. <laughs> 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 it it wouldn't have been the no, same I ask you, was, it, was this an accurate characterization <laughs> of your writing in those days or not? It's probably still accurate. <laughs> I rest my case. <laughs> <laughs> See, and I also grew up in a world, right, where there were very clear expectations about what you did not do. It's characteristic of that world, you know. And and and, 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 and when you misstep, you know, the sanction can be immediate and, pu and painful. This is linked in some way to what I'm trying to say, that if you grow up in a blue collar world, you learn to accept and live with the fact that somebody doesn't like you or they don't like something you've written. Who cares, right? Sun's gonna come up tomorrow. And I didn't mention this when you were talking, questioning me earlier. I think one of the things that has been very helpful to me is that I'm not afraid of failing, you know? And I mean, I, con I contrast myself frequently with most academics who come from a very different background and can't handle criticism. They can't handle it, you know? And, and in today's world where it's assumed that your self-esteem is going to plummet and you'll be homeless in a week if somebody tells you that ain't good work, you know? I mean, we're surrounded by people today who can't live with the fact that you're not measuring up. You know, you're going to have to tighten up here. You say anything critical to them, they go change their advisor, they drop out of school, who knows what they do. I mean, I never had that problem. You know. in, in the world I grew up in, you referred to your father as your old man. You know, my old man, you know, when you didn't do what you were expected to do, he didn't soft pedal it. You know. Get your out there and get that done. I think this is why I was able to work with you. Well, I've, I've thought more than once that we were able to get along, in part because uh, you didn't come from a privileged background. Whatever it is, it's not privileged. So. I think the one thing that affected my writing and academic career the most was I applied for a fellowship, and uh, I gave you the letter, 
and you called me to your office, <laughs> you threw the letter at me and said, if you don't care enough to edit, proofread this, why should I care enough to give you the job? And that moment I realized, I think we remember that. I, you know, I, I mean, cannot be doing this, this anymore. This is a universal, yeah. universally applicable, right? Now, I don't know. There's I, no need to go on. Sorry, go ahead. I, I think there was a, a few profanities in that <laughs> sentence, well, but the, the message was clear. I don't have a problem with your profanity. And, you know, you want to make your point. You want to emphasize that I'm serious about this. You know? But. It's absolutely true. I tell you the same day, thing today. You bring me something that you didn't proofread, and you want me to take it seriously. Get out of here. You know, if I'm if I'm sent a paper by a journal to review, and it's clear that the people didn't care enough, I'm I'm not going to spend ten minutes on it. No. It's insulting to me. You know, to me to take my time on something you cared so little about. Four or five years ago, last year or two of teaching, you know what the Ron McNair Fellowship Program is, right? So they have, you know what that is, Brendan. It's, it's a program funded by the, perhaps the only black astronaut who to, to fund undergraduate scholarships for minority students, right? So every year they circulate through the faculty a list of applicants and, and they ask you if, you if you're interested in working with the, any of these people and they indicate their interest. So after I had one McNair fellow who I was very unhappy with, and the second time, I said, I want the person to come over so I can talk to them before I make a decision on this. So it was a young woman. I read her application and I was impressed. These were exact words in her application. I believe to be on time, to be early is to be on time. To be on time is to be late. To be late is unacceptable. Exact words. She showed up 15 minutes late to my me to a meeting with me. I told her, I don't have time for you. You know, you wrote this and you're 15 minutes late? Hit the door. I met someone this morning who was a half hour late at a meeting. Well, I, he wasn't a half hour late. An editor. Right? Supposed to meet at 7 o'clock. Right? First of all, you're supposed to be 10 minutes early. Okay? That's what God ordained. That's what you should do. Right? So it gets to be 5 after 7. I'm pacing as only I can do. You know, like a caged animal. It's 10 after 7. He's still not there. As so I go to the desk, would you mind breaking this man's room? You know? And you know, he had recorded the time of 7. He made a mistake. 7:30, but he had no idea how pissed I was. You know, when I stood there for 20 minutes, pacing, waiting for him. Your time is more important than mine. Let me tell you, it is not. Okay. Well, I, I think part of the oral history project is to give some insights into the, the personality and characteristics of the scholars. <laughs> We've seen a range. Of yes. <laughs> of the chief's personality. So on behalf of the project and the discipline, thank you. Well, thank you. I, I was very surprised. It's a process of social alchemy at work here. <laughs> Have you ever heard that before? <laughs> you know, I don't know how it happened, you know. I, I got this thing in the mail, I guess from you, Brent. Yes. You know, saying that I had managed to offend enough people <laughs> that they thought it was worthwhile having me on, on record. It's how can you explain this? You know, if you've had a career of offending people. <laughs> I, I think future generations will benefit from uh, the, the aggravation factor here. So, <laughs> and I will gain some street cred. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's my walk two miles uphill in the snow. <laughs> do, you, do you hear this often from people? You work for Shover? <laughs> yes, Is that I still do. Yeah. <laughs> you hear this often? I do. <laughs> Give me the name. You think you had the name? Bad, let me tell you what he did to me. <laughs> See, in my in my opinion, you you can cut that whenever it's up to you. I'm just talking now. You know. It's